if you'll open your Bibles to uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, and we'll open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank You once again uh, for being gracious to us and allowing us to meet. Um, Father, I pray um, that we would not uh, take for granted the gift of being able to meet together uh, as a family and to worship You in song and to spend time in Your Word. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Um, Father, we, uh, we recognize how, uh, how wonderful it is uh, that You've given us Your Word. And uh, Father, I just pray um, that through our time in the Word tonight uh, that Your Spirit would speak to us uh, and that through uh, the study of Your Word, through the teaching of Your Word, uh, that we would become more like Christ. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians. And to answer anyone's questions, I've been asked this about five times today. No, we're not going to talk about the rapture. <laughs> so just, just put that out of your mind. <clears throat> uh, Paul opens up with a greeting. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church at, at, of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and Lord uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how you turned, from, uh, turned to God from the idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He has raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Our main focus tonight is going to be on verse 3. So Paul opens up like he does many of his epistles, thanking God for the church whom uh, he's had the pleasure of being able to minister to and giving thanks to the people in that church. And uh, all of his epistles, with the exception of Galatians, he's thankful for something about them in the church. And of the th folks in Thessalonica, he mentions three different things that he's thankful for in them. And we find those in verse 3. Uh, remembering uh, uh, before our God and Father your, number one, work of faith, number two, labor of love, and number three, your steadfastness and hope. He spends the rest of the book kind of fleshing out what these are and uh, points to examples in the folks at Thessalonica where these three aspects of their life come, come about. Points to things in his own life where these three aspects of his faith come about. And then at the end of the book, he begins to teach them and encourage them and exhort them further along in each of these three aspects of the Christian faith. Um, so it's kind of interesting. We see the words faith, love, and hope so many times paired together. Um, all throughout the New Testament, you'll see these three all together. Hardly ever, though, do you see them with the modifier of work, labor, and steadfastness. There is one place where you actually do see it. If you'll turn with me to Revelations chapter 2, still not talking about the apocalypse, so just <laughs> pump the brakes. Re uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, uh, in the letter to the church at Ephesus, Jesus says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Same three Greek words. Rather than using faith, love, and hope, Jesus refers to their works, their toil, and their patient endurance. So I think there's something here, and I think when you look closer to the book of, of Thessalonians, you'll see these themes come up over and over again of this pairing of these things. So first off, we'll start with the first one, work of faith. In the Greek, it actually has two definite articles. It's the work of the faith. The word for work is ergon. And it's a little different than our word for work because when we think of the word work, we think of a verb. We think of 
we think of I'm going to work, I work at doing this, I've done this work today. Um, in this text, in this part, it's more of a noun. It's to describe a deed, an accomplishment, something that's taken place in your life as a result of faith. So to kind of, uh, you see work and faith together several times in Scripture. One popular place is Ephesians chapter 2, and a verse that we all know quite well, and 2, 8 and, 8 and 10. Uh, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not the result of works, ergon. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. Uh, for we are His workmanship, same Greek word, different suffix or, or flavor to it, uh, created in Christ Jesus for good, ergon, works, uh, which Christ prepared, prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. And we all know that we're not saved by works, uh, that we're saved by faith. But yet, our faith is meaningless without works. James chapter 1, another very popular passage, where we see that our faith and works go together and that, that we can't have one without the other. So if your faith is true, it will come with ergon. It will come with these works, these things that are different about you, these accomplishments and these deeds in your life that have taken place as a result of your faith. Um, so in the case of the Thessalonians, uh, we see in verses 1-9 uh, that they had turned to God from idols. So that is an ergon that it took place in their life as a result of their faith. Um, prior to Paul bringing the, the gospel to Thessalonica, this was a, a very busy port city. It was a very popular port city as far as having a seaport in the uh, Aegean Sea, and then it was also on a major road between the east and the west. And so they had land travel coming through, they had sea travel coming through, they had tons of different cultures, and thus tons of different beliefs and religions. They had Jewish folks, they had Gentile folks, they had pagan folks, they had all these different groups of folks. And the church at Thessalonica was a mix mash of all these different peoples. And so one of the works of faith that Paul points out in their life is that they had turned uh, from idols to serve the true and living God. Chapter 2, verse 13 says that they received the Word uh, and it is at work in them. And the fact that they had readily received the Word of God and that the Gospel had been preached to them and that they listened and that they, that they heard the Word of God is a work of faith in their life. It's something that has taken place that can only be explained by their faith, which Ephesians tells us is a gift of God. Um, the other thing that we see, another example of their work, is uh, that they had become imitators of the other churches. Chapter 2, verse 14. Um, that they were not stubborn to try to set up their church the way they saw fit, but instead they humbled themselves to Paul's teaching. They humbled themselves to look to what the other churches were doing that were already established and tried to model themselves after them. They became imitators of Paul. Uh, that's uh, chapter 1, verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. So they not only modeled their church after other churches, they also modeled their lives after Paul and after what Scripture taught. They, they submitted themselves to that. That is not something that's natural for us. We want to do things our own way. We want to we want to be who knows best and, and, and make our own decisions for our own life. But the folks at Thessalonica, because of faith and the, and the work that faith had done in their lives, they became imitators of Paul. Um, Paul points to a few examples in his own life. Um, if you go through the book of Acts and you go through all the epistles that Paul wrote, you'll see just thousands and thousands and thousands of instances where Paul's life was dramatically changed because of his faith, where works after works after works had been, had been made manifest in his life as a result of his faith. Um, here in Thessalonians, we find uh, in chapter 2, verse 7, Paul says, We were uh, gentle among you, like a nursing mother, taking care of her own children, um, being, uh, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Thinking back to 
Acts chapter 9 Paul, this is a totally different Paul. Acts chapter 9 Paul was killing Christians. Acts chapter 8 Paul was holding people's coats while they stoned Stephen to death. And now Thessalonians chapter 2 Paul is a totally different person. Instead of killing Christians and murdering Christians, he's ministering to them and caring for them like a nursing mother. Um, Another example is in uh, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. For we know how like a father uh, with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. So Paul, once again, rather than trying to stamp out the Christian faith, because of the work of faith in his life, he had now completely switched gears, completely repented, and is now exhorting them. He's now bringing them the gospel. Um, uh, we also see uh, chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, actually, nope, chapter 2, verse 10. Put the wrong thing on my notes. Uh, Your witnesses and God also of how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you. And so Paul's life, it's very obvious, has been incredibly changed by the work of faith that's taken place in his life. Um, we see in uh, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, actually chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, so sorry. Uh, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. God is our witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, uh, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, that Paul's life is just over and over and over again an example of how faith has worked in his life. Not works that Paul's done, but the work that has come from the faith. And that's very important to see is the two definite articles before that, the ergon of the faith, the work of the faith. Because you can have a ton of works in your life. You can, be, you can give money to the poor. You can do all of these different things, anything that you can name of that's work. But if it's not stemming from faith, then it's worthless. It's absolutely worthless. You can do all the charity. You can give your life to all these number of causes and do all of this so-called good work. But if it's not the work of the faith, then it's worthless. Once again, you can have a faith, but if it's not the specific faith and it does not come with the specific work that is of the specific faith, then it's worthless. And so um, I think it's important that those that those uh, definite articles are there. We'll move right along uh, to the next phrase, labor of love. And once again, it's got the definite articles of the labor of the love. Uh, the Greek words, uh, I always, when I first picked up this passage, I thought, what's the difference in labor and work? Because I thought they were the same. It just seemed like a different word. Uh, but it is a different word in the Greek. The word's kopos, K-O-P-O-S. And it means to toil, to work to the point of fatigue. It is a blood, sweat, and tears type of work. Um, it is a, a giving of yourself to service to the point of causing you physical, emotional distress. Um, that is what the tone of that word is. It's used several different times in scriptures in different ways. Um, one instance in particular, um, when Jesus is approached by the Pharisees and they throw down the adulterous woman in front of him, and ask him for permission to stone her, Jesus says, why are you bothering this woman? Why are you copos, same word, this woman? Why are you causing her distress? So it's different than ergon work, where ergon work is a deed that's accomplished in your life, something that is, that is different because of the faith. Copos is you serving, you toiling, you exhausting yourself in the service of others, as a result of the love. And the love word is agape love, the self-sacrificing love. So the next characteristic that Paul brings out in these people, that he's thanking God for them, that he sees in their life, is that they toil and strive to serve people out of the self-sacrificing type of love, the God type of love. Um, for the Thessalonians, we see an example of this in... Chapter 1, uh, verse 9. Uh, For they themselves report concerning us the type of reception we had among you, how you had turned from God, turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. 
That's their, that's their, their labor of love. Um, verse 8 in chapter 1 says that their faith had gone everywhere. They had worked tirelessly um, despite being a newer church and have just received the gospel um, you know, maybe a year or two prior to this being written. They had worked tirelessly to spread the gospel. Um, and that's in spite of persecution, in spite of hardship that was caused by, um, by uh, the folks in Thessalonica and no doubt in everywhere else. Um, if you read through the book of Acts, you'll find a very uh, re- a recurring theme of Paul preaches, Paul gets beat up and kicked out of town. Paul preaches, Paul gets beat up and kicked out of town. If it happened to Paul, it no doubt happened to the, Thessal- the, the folks in Thessalonica that were also spreading the gospel everywhere. Paul had made it all the way down to Athens at this point, I think, and he said he had been hearing about the folks from Thessalonica from all over. Um, so their faith had gone out. Um, in all of Macedonia and Achaia, and also the rest of the known world, that, that what had taken place in the uh, lives of the Thessalonians had gone out that far. And so it's obvious that they were laboring and striving out of this self-sacrificial love. Um, uh, they had suffered persecution from their fellow countrymen, chapter 2, verse 14. In Paul's life, in uh, what this looks like for him uh, is in chapter 2, verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. There's our word, kopos. We worked day and night that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim the gospel of God. Paul was not this traveling evangelist that would go and collect love offerings everywhere he would go and live off of it. Paul didn't have a jet that he flew around in or any of this other craziness that we see today. Paul would work all day building tents, and then after he was done building tents for the day, he would preach the gospel and minister to the body. And he did this everywhere that he went. And so that is Paul working to the point of exhaustion uh, for the sake of the self-sacrificing agape type love. Um, Paul uh, also had the boldness to proclaim the gospel everywhere he went in spite of persecution and suffering. Paul was beat up several times, left for dead a few times, uh, shipwrecked a couple times, bit by a snake. I mean, the list of bad things that happened to Paul as a result of his faithfulness to preach the gospel um, is just incredible. Um, you know, he mentions in chapter 2, verse 2, uh, that, uh, but, but though we had already suffered and had been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel in the midst of much conflict. Paul uh, was planning to go one way and instead had a dream about a Macedonian guy asking for help, and so he turns and goes up into Macedonia, goes to Philippi, gets beat up and thrown out of town, goes to Thessalonica, gets beat up and thrown out of town, makes it to Berea. The folks from Thessalonica tell the folks in Berea about how bad Paul is. They beat him up, throw him out of town. Then he heads down into Greece and you know goes from there. And so Paul is an excellent example of this kopos type of toil and suffering, um, and he does so for uh, the sake of his brotherly love or his, his uh, self-sacrificing type love for uh, those who are uh, chosen of God. Our next term is steadfastness of hope. The Greek word is hupomone. It's a compound word meaning under abide. So this is not what we would call endurance, it's, not, it's stronger than that. It's not what we would call perseverance, it's stronger than that. We don't really have a good word in English for it, um, but I have a couple of uh, uh, folks I found in commentaries um, that had a pretty good definition of this word. Uh, one guy says it's literally abiding under pressure. The root idea of hupomone is uh, that of remaining under some discipline, subjecting oneself to something which demands the acquiescence of the will to something against one would naturally rebel. It portrays a picture of steadfastly and unflinchingly bearing up under a heavy load and describes that quality of character which does not allow one to suffer circumstances or succumb under trial. The picture is that of steadfastness constantly uh, uh, const- constancy and endurance. It has in it a forward look, the ability to focus on what is beyond the current pressures. 
And that's why hupomone or steadfastness is paired with hope. Because without our hope in Christ, it's impossible to hupomone. It's impossible to put ourselves up under and, uh, and abide in all the stresses and pressures of what it means to live here on earth. Um, the Thessalonians had a very real pressing opportunity to practice this steadfastness in that they were being persecuted by uh, the folks that they used to call friends. They were being per- persecuted by their neighbors. They were being persecuted by their family um, because of their faith. And Paul praises them and thanks God for them because they exhibit steadfastness of hope. And uh, just like with the other two, you can't really separate the two. Um, You can be steadfast and stubborn and stick with it, but if it's not out of the hope that we have in Christ, it's worthless. Um, You know... Let's say that you've got a terrible job, but you're so stubborn, you're just not going to quit. And you just stick with it, and you work there 40 years and retire. But if it's not out of uh, your hope that comes in Christ that you do that, it's worthless. Um, this is not some sort of, uh, some sort of um, heroic, courageous endurance that you stick with and, and in, um, in the hopes of, of getting glory from men. But instead, it's a steadfastness that comes that from knowing that there is hope and reward coming in heaven. And uh, so we see Paul talk about this kind of hope and this kind of steadfastness in Romans chapter 5. Um, Romans chapter 5, uh, let's see, verse. we'll just start in verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, Uh, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our sufferings produces endurance, or hupomone, uh, and our endurance produces character, and our character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because of God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Um, In the lives of the Thessalonians, they exhibited this as they continued to be faithful in spite of persecution. Um, Chapter 1, verse 10, uh, Paul mentions that not only had they turned to God from the idols, not only were they serving the living God, but uh, verse 10 says, "...and they waited for the Son." Um, who, who is from heaven. And so the, the, Thessalonians, the Thessalonians had all these things in their lives that had, become, that had become accomplished in their lives because of their faith. They had exhibited this, this, uh, this ability to toil and to work and to fatigue uh, out of love for God and out of love for their fellow, uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And they had exhibited this steadfastness to, to uh, put themselves and, and keep themselves under this pressure from the outside world because of their hope that they had in Christ. Um, uh, for Paul, uh, what this looks like, um, first off, from Acts chapter 9 on, all of Paul's life was centered around his steadfastness in the hope of the coming kingdom. Um, Everything that you see Paul doing, this is kind of undergirding Paul's ability to do this, to do all the amazing things that he did. Um, In Thessalonians, he mentions uh, in chapter 2, verse 19, um, For what is our hope and our joy and our crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Paul took great comfort in knowing that when he had finished the race, that... um, one of the uh, things that would bring him joy at, 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 um, at the end of his race was knowing that he had been able to minister to the Thessalonians and that the Thessalonians had been, had been faithful uh, and the Thessalonians had, had labored and toiled for love and the Thessalonians were remaining steadfast in their hope. And so that also gave Paul hope. So... 
then acknowledging all of those things, Paul gets to chapter 4 and uh, then begins to exhort them. Um, it's all well and good for Paul, and it is a good thing for Paul to have, have uh, encouraged this church, had, had acknowledged uh, all that God was doing in this church, but at the same time, um, this church is also in need of sanctification. Um, and so in uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 3, this is the will of God, uh, your sanctification. And Paul's going to spell that out and, and hit on all these three different topics. And he starts off with, with a work of the faith that needs to take place in their life that hasn't yet. Um, and so uh, verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, uh, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, uh, that no one transgresses and wrongs his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us to impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. So, what does this mean for us? Well, I don't know. Maybe you are struggling with sexual immorality. And if that's the case, then that is a work. Your, your purity, from that standpoint, is a work that needs to happen as a result of your faith. Um, what does it mean for any of us? It's probably different for all of us. In the case of the Thessalonians, this was an issue in the church that he saw, that Timothy had reported back to him and said, hey, this thing's going on, this thing's going on. Paul doesn't really go on any specifics, but what he says is pretty clear. And so even though uh, we can look back and see all the accomplishments that have taken place in our life as a result of our faith, all the, all the sanctification work that has been going on since we've come to faith and how, how we're more holy today than we were yesterday, we need to continue to strive towards becoming more holy tomorrow than we are today. And we need to continue to strive, strive to allow our faith result in works, to allow our faith to uh, have air gone in our life um, so that five years from now we can look back on today and say, wow, this is what God's done in my life since then. And, um, you know, in the case of the Thessalonians, it was sexual morality. In your case, it may be something different. Um, we all have stuff that we need to do better. Um, and we all have ways that we're falling short. And by the grace of God, we'll be sanctified in those things uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, the next thing he moves on to is uh, labor of love. And in verse 9, chapter 4, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may, not, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So... Yes, Paul recognizes that they were doing fantastic at loving one another, and yet he still urges them to love even more, do even more. Um, in our church, there's no shortage of love for each other. There are people here that toil and that work to exhaustion and that you don't even know it. I don't even know it of what all people are doing and, and doing for each other, and that's great. But I would exhort you to love even more work even more, toil even more, um, and uh, do so looking to um, the love that's been shared with us from God. Um, he also mentions that they are to work hard and live quiet lives. In, in their context, working and, and earning money to support your family must be very difficult because a lot of these guys lost their jobs and couldn't work and whatever business they had, people might not buy from them because, they're, because they are um, Christians and, and have been ostracized from society. And so rather than complaining about it or going on whatever social media they had at the time and, 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 and talking about this or talking about that, Paul encourages them, work hard, keep your head down, and live a quiet life. Why? So you're an example to everyone else. I think this is a very timely word for our time. Um, and I've been as guilty of it, Hannah knows 
complaining about all of the craziness with this goofy virus. Um, but God didn't call us out of darkness into light so that we could go on Facebook and complain. God didn't call us to be complainers out in the world. He called us to be a light out in the world. And I'm as guilty as anybody of bringing more darkness than light out into the world. So I think this is a very, very timely word for us, maybe just for myself, to work quietly, do what you've got to do, take care of those who've been given to you, and do so as an example to outsiders. He didn't want them to be dependent on anybody, um, which... If your income has been taken away, that's very difficult. Very difficult. But um, he, Paul, is calling them to work hard and keep quiet in faith and do so to the point of exhaustion, our word kopos, laboring, toiling, and do so out of agape type of love, self-sacrificing love. The next exhortation that he gives is... Um, steadfastness of hope. And he had already acknowledged in chapter 1, verse 10, that they were waiting on the sun. They were looking towards the rapture and the coming kingdom and all of these things. Obviously, they had questions about it and they were talking about it. And so Paul gives them a little bit of teaching about it so that he could help to clear up their, some of their things that they might have had wrong or that they were confused about. And so that's where we get uh, this teaching in chapter 4, verse 13. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, uh, through Jesus, we'll bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you, that by word from the Lord, those who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven and with a cry and a command, uh, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so we will always be uh, with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So Paul's teaching on the resurrection is not to help fulfill some curiosity. It's not to help spark controversies and then try to figure out this, that, and the other and do some weird math and figure out what day Jesus is coming back. The purpose of these words was to encourage them. As they see their brothers and sisters being drug out in the street and persecuted, maybe even put to death, they needed this kind of encouragement. We have been so sheltered from that that we have nothing better to do than argue when Jesus is going to come back. As if Paul didn't say enough by saying, hey, this is for you to encourage people. He goes on in chapter 5 and says, now concerning the times and the seasons, you have nothing else to be written to you. You don't need to know anything else. That's not the point. The point isn't for you to be able to figure this out. The point isn't for you to have a, a, a up-to-the-minute uh, uh, documented uh, schedule of what the apocalypse is going to be. This is not what that's about. This is about you see suffering, you see your friends losing their jobs, losing their lives, you see yourself where you're worried what's going to happen to me tomorrow if I continue to be a Christian, and they need to encourage one another by pointing to the resurrection. We don't even think about the resurrection unless we're trying to get a chart out and figure out when it's going to happen. Right? We don't even think about the resurrection until we see something like two hurricanes trying to converge on the internet, and then we're like, okay, well, maybe this is it. Let me thumb through Daniel and see if I can find this and make a reference here. That's not the point of it. That's why there's not more teaching about it. That's why you can't pin down a date or whatever, because we would spend all day trying to figure that out. But this is for the encouragement of each other. And I think this is something we could definitely do a better job at, of encouraging one another and saying, hey, you know what? It really stinks that your hours got cut, but Jesus is coming back. Hey, it really stinks this happened to you at work and you didn't get that promotion and the other person that deserved it got it and you didn't, but you know what? Everything's going to be made right in the end. Hey, this bad thing happened to you and that really stinks and this person's being awful to you but God's the one who judges, and this is all going to be made right. And we just don't do that. 
or I, I don't know, maybe I just don't do that. Maybe y'all are great at doing that, but I, I've not. I, I'll be honest, I spend very little time thinking about that. I'm so wrapped up in everything that's going on right now that I have forgotten to look forward to what's coming and to let that be my fuel for carrying on rather than just gritting my teeth and going about my day and being disgruntled and angry all the time about stuff. Uh, instead, we should strive for the steadfastness of the hope. And our hope should be in Christ and His coming. Our hope should not be in a doctor finding a cure for this stupid virus. Our hope should not be in a mask or a social distancing order. Our hope should not be in whoever gets elected in November. Our hope should be in Christ and His coming. Because none of that stuff is going to fix anything. If someone cures this virus, there'll be another one in a couple years. If, and people will still die of other things. Whoever gets elected in November, they're going to be sinful and flawed. And our country's still going to be really awful and terrible because that's, <laughs> that's the way that things go. Because it's a man-made institution. And, and it's run by sinful men. So... Our hope should be in Christ. Our hope should not be in anything else. Um, Paul finishes by reiterating these three things. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 9. Nope, chapter 5, verse 8. Let's see. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope and salvation. And even though we hear those three words over and over again, even though you can go to Hobby Lobby and find a thousand decorations that that exhibit the words faith, love, and hope, I hope that after reading Thessalonians and spending a little few minutes here that you would recognize that work goes with faith, labor goes with love, and steadfastness goes with hope. And that when you see those three words, that you would put the two together the same way Jesus does when He's talking to the church at Ephesus. Let's pray.